Hi, I'm Joe James. In this series of videos, we're going to learn to analyze data, doing some data science functions using Python. The primary libraries we're going to use are pandas and matplotlib. We're going to look at the Iris dataset, which is a very famous data set that's very commonly used for starter projects in data science. So the first video, we're going to analyze that data, which means we're going to look at how the data is dispersed or distributed across its different attributes, what attributes it has and what values are in those attributes. And we're going to do that graphically using matplotlib. So we'll use uh, scatter plots and a variety of different plots and graphs so that we can see how the data is spread out. And as usual, I'm going to post both the data set, the iris data set, as well as this Jupyter Notebook code in my GitHub site, which the link is down below. So you can download the code and run it yourself. In the next video after this one, we're going to look at how to classify data. So we're going to group according to a species so that we can predict the species of a new flower, just given its attributes. And that's called a classification problem in data science. We're gonna learn how to write code from scratch um, using the K nearest neighbors algorithm, which is a very common uh, algorithm for classification of data. So without further ado, let's dig in and look at this, what we have here, the Iris data set. So first we need a few imports. We have uh, NumPy as NP, Pandas as PD, and Matplotlib as uh, PLT. We're going to load in the data using read CSV that loads it right into a Pandas data frame. The data frame we're going to have is called data. In the iris data, like I said, you can get this on my GitHub site, iris.data. I'll put a link down below. And then we can print out using the head function. If you've watched one of my pandas videos already, the tutorial, it shows you exactly how to use the head function. But this video will also serve as a good refresher for panda skills. So if we run that, you can see the output we get is uh, the first five rows. And we can see that we have um, basically four attributes, sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width. And then we have a species, which is the, known as the label of the data, right? So what species? There are four attributes, and then there's this redundant thing, ID, because pandas already assigns an ID to each row. So we don't need that. So the next step we want to do is uh, delete this redundant column, and then we're going to rename these other columns here just numerically so they're easier to work with. So our first line of code here is going to drop the ID column. We don't need that. One tells it that it's a column and not a row, and then its label is ID. So that's going to drop this column. And it, by the way, it's important to have data equals here. If you just do data.drop, it doesn't save that change over the top of the uh, data frame. So data equals data.drop. And the second one, like I said, we're going to rename these. The, we're going to assign the column names in case we need those later. Uh, sepal length sepal width, petal length, and petal width. We'll put those into a list called calls. That way we can grab those column names if we ever need them. And these correspond exactly to these 0, 1, 2, and 3. And then we're going to rename those columns using the data.rename. And we put the uh, dictionary inside of there with the current column name and then the new column name, which for us is just numerical. It's an integer. We have to either put in place equals true here, or we can put data equals the way we did up here in lieu of the in place equals true. Either one of those will work, but just to make it save over the top of our data frame. And lastly, we're going to show uh, some of the rows of data. And we're going to use that instead of using the head function, we could have used head um, to show the first five rows or however many. So we're going to show from zero to the end, which is there's 150 rows, but we're going to show only every 50th one. So we have a step of 50 here. So yeah, we get every 50th record. So 0th record, 50th record, and 100th record. And we can see that the ID column is gone, and our columns are all renamed 0, 1, 2, and 3. Next, we want to look at the shape of the data. And describe will give us a statistical overview of the data. Let me run that and show you what it looks like. So you see the shape of the data is 150 rows of data and five columns, including this label here. And statistically, this is how these attributes, the numerical attributes, break down. So we give the count, there are 150 rows, 
It gives us the average of each one of those columns, the standard deviation, min, max, 25, 50th, and 75th percentile. So we can kind of see how the data is distributed for each one of these columns, right? Uh, the first column looks like it ranged from 4.3 to 7.9, and then the second column from 2 to 4.4, and so on. So that already tells us a lot about how these four attributes are distributed across the data. Now we're going to look at value counts, since one thing they didn't show here is how many of each species we have in the data set. Um, so we can look at data.species.value counts. That will give us a count of the number of species. And another way to do this, by the way, you see we can use data.species to access the species column, or we can use data and then square brackets and parentheses species, the name of that column. So there's two different ways to access that species column. And then we use value counts to give us the total count of each species. So we see we have three different species of flowers. And here they are. And then we have 50 of each, exactly 50 of each. We can plot a very simple histogram of this data, plt.hist. So this is the PyPlot library we're using. And it has a histogram. So it's very simple to plot a histogram. You can pass in the data. Here we're just going to pass in one column of data, which is column 0. So we can see how it's dispersed from ranging from 4.5 to almost 8. Uh, and you can see it's kind of center weighted. But that kind of shows you a lot about how, how the data is spread out for this one attribute. And we could do the same thing. We could plot histograms for each of the four attributes in separate histograms. But another way to do that is just to plot all four histograms onto a, a single diagram. So if we do plt.hist, and then we pass in all four of those attributes, all four columns of data, let's see what happens there. So we get a color-coded histogram. And you'll see that um, it's, it's color-coded. So red represents one piece of data, or one column. Orange is another column. Green is another column. And blue is another column. Well, it'd be really nice if, there, if we just had labels on there for the columns so we know which color represents which piece of data. So the way to add labels to this is when we call this histogram, when we create the histogram, we have to assign label equals and then the label names that we want those column labels to be. And luckily for us, we save those column names, right? Sepal length, sepal width, uh, petal length, and petal width. So we save those into this columns list, and then we can just um, slap those four values from the columns list in there. These are just strings. So we have the four labels of the columns there. And then we have to also add plt.legend. So those are two things we need to do to add a legend. plt.legend, and we need to add the labels into our histogram call. And when we do that, you see we get this nice little legend in the top there. So sepal length is in blue, sepal width is in orange, uh, petal width, petal length is in green, and petal width is in red. Now another way to show all of the data in a single histogram is to make four separate calls to plt.hist. And what it's going to do when we do that is going to keep adding data on top of each other. So it's going to add data 1 on top of uh, data 0's plot and data 2 on top of data 1's plot and so on. So they're going to kind of be overlapped here instead of spread out the way these are, side by side. But this is kind of useful. So you can see that there are all four colors here. They're color-coded, automatically color-coded, right? We didn't have to do any color-coding ourselves. The histogram creator automatically color-codes this data for us. The problem is if some of the stuff is in the back, it's kind of hard to see. So one fix for that is to add a transparency level, which is very simple to do in PyPlot. You just use this uh, variable called alpha. And alpha of 1, this is a floating point value. So alpha of 1 means opaque. That means you can't see through it at all, right? It's solid. Alpha of 0 means it's completely transparent. So if we, you'll see if we get an alpha of 0.5 or 6, it's like semi-transparent. And we'll be able to see if we make these the front shapes transparent, semi-transparent, uh, we'll be able to see the back shapes better. So this is what we get when we um, add an alpha value. Alpha get, Again, alpha 1 is the same thing as 
no value because the default is 1. But alpha of 0.5 or 0.6, like this red here is, you can see it's, it's semi-transparent and it looks like the green is also semi-transparent. So one of these two is red and one and the other is green. Now maybe a better way to show uh, the histogram of the data is to show each one of these data sets, the, each column, on its own plot. And we can do that using subplots so that they kind of all show up in one large figure with four separate subplots. And that is coming out like this. So they all show in the same color because they're four separate plots, right? But um, it shows you how each one of those four attributes, the data is distributed among it. And we know that this is data zero right here. And probably this is data one, data two, and data three. But if we wanted, we could also add labels to these. So we add labels using a uh, set title. So we set a title for each one of these and we just add that column name, right? So it's gonna be sepal width, sepal length, uh, petal width and petal length, and then plt.show. So here's what our subplot looks like when we add titles to each one of these plots, sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width. Now in this form, it's a lot easier actually to compare how the data is distributed between different attributes, right? So sepal length versus petal length. Uh, petal length, it looks binary, right? There are some that are very low, under two, and others that are over four, but there's nothing in between. And the same with uh, petal width. Versus the first two attributes, sepal length and sepal width, you can see them clustered towards the center, more of a bell-shaped curve. So that's about all the value that we can get out of histograms. I think that gives us a good analysis of the data, but we're gonna look at some other plotting types and you're gonna see that they have some advantages over histograms. So it's very simple to create a basic scatter plot. So where you have an X and Y coordinate and then you plot points uh, for each data point. And we can do that, we have to pick two coordinates, right here we picked zero and one, so the first two columns of data. So you can see how the data is spread out across those two attributes. The problem is we don't really know which species each one of these is, so we really need some kind of color coding or distinction some way to distinguish each species. Otherwise, how can we, how can we figure out how to cluster the groups of data based on species? So the first thing we're gonna do is assign a color code. We'll create a dictionary called colors, and we have our species name here, it's just a string, and then what color we want that. So we've picked three colors and we're going to assign those to those three species. And then we'll create the scatter plot. We have to add this extra little chunk of code here, C, or you can type out color if you want, C is for color, equals uh, data of species dot map colors. And then it's going to map this to translate the uh, value of species into the color for that point on the scatter plot. So a simple dictionary for the color assignment by species, and then this color equals data species dot map. And when we run that, we get a much more readable diagram. By the way, here we use different attributes. We used attributes two and three. And we can see here that we have um, the red, whichever one that is. Look, iris centosa is completely segregated from the other two. So it's gonna be easy to cluster red here, right? We'll easily be able to distinguish any new instances of an iris. It'll be easy to classify the red ones. Uh, but the blue and green, there's a lot of overlap here. It's gonna be very difficult to distinguish between iris virginica and iris versicolor using these two attributes only. So hopefully the other attributes will reveal that we can distinguish between uh, those two species of flower more easily. So let's look at uh, two other columns of data. So column zero and column two, we'll plot those two. Again, we're gonna use the same color map. This colors up here is still active down here. And then we're gonna label, we're gonna label the axes so that we can see which value is on which axis. So we see petal length is on the Y axis and sepal length on the X axis. That helps us understand this graph a lot more, what's going on. And again, we can still see that red is segregated from the others. That's nice. This is iris setosa again in red at the bottom. So we know that if, let's say, uh, 
a new instance of an iris has a petal length of less than two, it's going to be iris setosa, right? So that helps us in classification of the flower, which you'll see in the next video. We're going to focus purely on uh, classification. Next, we'll add a title to our plot. This is a pretty simple addition here. Um, iris data scatter plot. That's just simply plt.title. So we've added x and y axis labels and a title to our plot, and we added color coding since we started out with the very simple scatter plot. So as we add a little more data to this plot, it becomes more useful because we can really see what the data is and what's going on. By the way, here we're showing columns one and three. So I've done different scatter plots with different columns of data. Another thing we may want to look at is correlation. So we can uh, use data.corr. This is a function in the data frame that allows us to see the correlation between any two columns of data. So these are column numbers 0, 1, 2, and 3, and these are also column numbers 0, 1, 2, and 3, and you can see the correlations. Now another way to show this data is using box and whisker plots, commonly usually just called box plots. And the benefit of this is that it shows you not only the middle of the data, but the whole range of data. So it will show you the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentile, and it can also show you outlier data. So here we just call plt.boxplot. It calls the constructor for the box plot, and then we pass in our data. We have four different columns, we pass those all in. And what we get, this is a box and whisker plot. So this gives us the range of data with the 25th, 50th, and 75th percentile, the box plot. And if there are some outliers, these are designated with these funky little circles here. So each of the four different attributes, we get to see its own box plot. This doesn't help us though very much because we can't really see how the data is spread across the different species. So one way to show how data is spread across different species is to use um, data.boxplot and then just pass in one column of data and then we can say by equals species. So we can see here that we get a separate box plot for each of the three species and this is all just one column of data. Now what we'd ideally like here is to see each of these three species with no overlap with the others. That would make it easier for us to distinguish or classify a new instance of an iris. But when there's a big overlap, right, we, we, let's say for example a 6.0 for attribute 0, there actually probably could be any of these three. Or 5.5, it could be any of these three. We really don't know, right? If we get a attribute 0 of 7.5, it's probably going to be Iris virginica, or if we get it of only 4.5, it's probably going to be Iris setosa. But if it's a middle value for this attribute, then we really don't know which one of these three species it is. So we'd really like to see more definitive um, gap between these, these three species for each attribute. So a good next step is to break this out so that we can see by species and by attribute. So here we're going to set up subplots again, similar to what we did with histograms, right? A two by two box of four subplots. And we're going to start by assigning A, this column zero to A, right? And we have them grouped by species. So then when we pass those into our box plot constructor, we'll get separate plots for each of these four, and they'll all have three different plots on them. Uh, let me run this instead of trying to explain what's happening. So the very first diagram is the A data, right? Which is column zero, sepal length, right? We added a label there, sepal length. That's our set title, column zero, right here. And box plot of A is the A data. So we start out with data zero, which is column zero of data and grouped by species. This is how we do group by species. So that's what we get for column zero, column one or sepal width, column two or petal length, and column three petal width. 
And you can see that pedal length and width show a lot more difference or variation in the values for those attributes among the different species. And if instead of using four separate subplots, we wanted to lump all these 12 diagrams, 12 box plots, into a single table, we could do that. Uh, but we probably would need to um, color code them all. So a way to do that is here. Um, we set up a little color function to paint the boxes um, red, blue, and green, depending on um, which species it is. And we did exactly the same thing here, A, B, C, D. We assigned the data to uh, for uh, columns 0, 1, 2, and 3, uh, grouped by species. And then down here we call the box plot function. And by the way, there are a couple of extra little things I added in here. Um, this is going to remove the outlier symbols, which are those little circles you see on our box plots. And positions 1, 2, and 3 is going to help us space these box plots the way we want them spaced out horizontally. So each time we call a box plot function, we remove, we pass in the data A, we remove those outlier symbols, we set the positioning uh, horizontally across it, the width is 0.7, and then after that we call this set color function. And lastly we're going to label these axes. So now we can see the final box plot we get, we have all 12 graphs on it of 12 different box plots. So three color-coded box plots for each of the four attributes. So now that we've analyzed all the data in detail, we've plotted it out in multiple different ways using histograms, scatter plots, and box plots. We can apply these same concepts to any data set. In the next video, we'll learn how to classify a new instance of an iris. In other words, determine what species it probably belongs to by making a prediction using its attribute values. I hope this video was helpful for you. If so, please click the like button and subscribe to my channel. I'm Joe James. Thanks for watching.